It's the musical that took the world by storm. The story of Alexander Hamilton, one of the more obscure founding fathers, told through the medium of hip hop that dazzled America and became an overnight sensation. The play is exciting to see. The production itself was just so live. You, know, you go there and you walk out and you're flying. You know, I became part of the chorus of people telling people, man, this is really something. The show made an instant star of its young creator, Lin-Manuel Miranda, whose singular vision transformed Broadway, bringing the sounds and faces of 21st century America to a retelling of his nation's history. It was just remarkable that he took a traditional American message and turned it into a contemporary hip hop telling of a great story. It really marked a watershed moment, I think, in Broadway, not only because of its inclusion of hip hop, but for the way that it has changed and opened up a space for people of color in a way that's, that's, been, that's been amazing to see. He's a genius. He's somebody who represents something that we haven't seen on Broadway in a really long time, the self-contained auteur. There are very few people I can think of on Broadway who wrote the script, wrote the lyrics, wrote the music, and starred in the show. This is the story of Hamilton, the phenomenon, the history, and the man whose outstanding talent made it all happen. You have somebody who's like deeply well-read, charismatic, into pop culture, uh, historically savvy. He married all these three things together, and it was just like this weird kind of like strand of dynamite, man. And then, you know, it, it hit Broadway, and it's just like, boom. When Hamilton first premiered in February 2015, it was an instant hit. Universally acclaimed by critics, the play soon became the hottest ticket in New York City, with cues for the chance to get a seat stretching around the block. The unlikely mix of history, hip hop, and musical theater had caught almost everyone by surprise. And as the Hamilton phenomenon grew, public attention was quick to focus on the show's charismatic creator and star, Lin-Manuel Miranda. Lin-Manuel Miranda is a actor, a singer, a rapper, a librettist, composer. And he works primarily in musical theater, but he's also done television, he's done film. And he's one of the most powerful and sort of galvanizing forces right now in the American musical theater scene. He went to Wesleyan, which is a good liberal arts school. And it was at that time that he began to merge a lot of his interests from his youth growing up in New York in musical theater, in hip hop, salsa, and other kinds of Latino music. He began to use those to forge musical theater of his own that would, in the end, come to form a kind of a revolution in what musical theater could be. He is rare, especially because he's also a performer. The only thing Lynn is missing is Lynn is not a director or a choreographer. He may well become a director, I don't know. He's certainly a capable, talented guy, he could do it. Born in 1980 to Puerto Rican parents, Miranda was raised in the heavily Latino neighborhoods of both Washington Heights and Inwood in New York's Upper Manhattan. His gift for music and the performing arts showed itself at a young age and earned him a place at the liberal arts college Wesleyan University in the late 90s. It was at Wesleyan that the young Lin-Manuel first started to combine his twin interests of hip hop and theater. He founded an improvisational hip hop troupe called Freestyle Love Supreme and performed in numerous musical and theater productions on campus. But it was during his sophomore year at Wesleyan that Lin-Manuel's prodigious talent started to separate him from his peers. He began writing the first draft of In the Heights a musical with an unusual blend of Latin music, salsa, and elements of rap that was set in the Dominican American neighborhood of Washington Heights in New York City. Together with the young theater director, Thomas Kale, Miranda developed the play into a full-blown Broadway production, which premiered in Connecticut in 2005, before finally achieving a major opening on Broadway in 2008. I loved musicals, I wanted a life in musicals, 
I knew I was never gonna get cast as Bernardo because I don't dance that, I don't, I'm not a ballet dancer. I knew I was never gonna get cast of Man of La Mancha because I have a rock voice. I don't have an operatic voice. And if you want to be in musicals and you're a Puerto Rican dude, that's all you get. Um, that was what existed in the canon. And so um, I, I started writing in the Heights because I wanted to make a way for myself. It's a story about Dominican Americans living in Washington Heights in New York, which is where Lin-Manuel Miranda is from. So it's a kind of story of, of the lives of these people who have dreams and aspirations and hopes and desires to achieve the American dream. In the Heights kind of established, to me, is established him as the new Spike Lee. Uh, it's this brilliant piece of writing, and on surface level, you think it's the story about striving, uh, which it is, and, and also family and kind of uh, this cultural diversity where you see this Latin family in the Heights in the section of Manhattan. But really, it's this story about gentrification. In the Heights is a very traditional musical. What made it distinct from that tradition was that it was using different sounds than had formerly been used to such an extent in musical storytelling on Broadway. Specifically, it uh, merged in an early form uh, hip hop and Latin music. We haven't had a lot of um, um, Latino shows on Broadway. I mean, I think of West Side Story and In the Heights, and that's pretty much the extent of it. And Lynn is a New York City kid. And a lot of Broadway shows tended to be set either in the past or in a kind of fantasy world, you know, the fantasy world of the Lion King or the uh, 19th century opera house of the Phantom of the Opera. Lynn's show was contemporary. It was his life in the Heights, the people in his neighborhood. 96,000. Damn! 96,000? Dollars? Holla! 96,000! That's a lot of street cams. 96,000! Yo, if I won the lotto tomorrow, well, I know I wouldn't bother going on no spending spree. I'd pick a business school and pay the entrance fee. Then maybe if you're lucky, you'll stay friends with me. I'll be a businessman richer than Nina's daddy. Donald Trump and I on the links, and he's my caddy. My money's making money. I'm going from Poto Moto. Keep the bling. I want the bread. Ring like Frodo. Oh no, here goes Mr. Braggadocio. Next thing you know, he's lying like Pinocchio. It's just the language, the excitement of it. In the Heights, when it was on Broadway, it was just a really exciting cultural moment. It was really powerful. And I think a lot of that is rooted in Lin Manuel's skill. The incredible charisma of Lin Manuel Miranda, that was the first time we had seen that coming through full bore in a musical written by the person who was playing it. It's important to note that both in In the Heights and it, especially in Hamilton, a lot of it was written by the author for himself to perform, knowing what he can do. It is extremely rare. In the Heights proved to be a spectacular success and established Miranda as a major new voice in musical theater. The play was nominated for a total of 13 Tony Awards, winning for Best Musical, Best Original Score, Best Choreography, and Best Orchestrations, as well as picking up a Grammy Award for Best Musical and a nomination for the Pulitzer Prize for Drama. Yes. <laughs> I mean, uh, I expected it because, um, just because, I don't know, I, I, I that's, you, you gotta think, you gotta dream big if you're gonna get there. Um, did I, but I expected it sort of on the same level you expect to become a Jedi Knight when you're three and you've seen Return of the Jedi. It was a fantasy, but I never knew that it would come true. Um, so I feel just so blessed and, and happy to be here with this show that's been a real labor of love um, for, for eight years. A few months after In the Heights opened on Broadway, Lin-Manuel read historian Ron Chernow's biography of Alexander Hamilton. It proved to be a life-changing event. One of the more obscure founding fathers, few Americans would know much about Hamilton, other than that his face appears on the $10 bill. But Miranda was fascinated by his story and began to imagine a new project, a musical based around the life of Alexander Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton was probably the most important person off the American Revolution who was not president. Alexander Hamilton was born out of wedlock in the West Indies. He is an orphan by the time he's 14 years old. 
He struggled. He was very uh, fortunate to have some people who became um, really his supporters, his benefactors, and that's how he ended up in New York. As a young man, he knew poverty. He had seen it, he had experienced it, and that really shaped his life. Hamilton's early life took place during the most critical period in American history. The Revolutionary War broke out while he was still a student, and the young Hamilton took a full part in the political turbulence of the time, eventually rising to become one of the most important figures in the birth of American independence. Alexander Hamilton started writing in support of the revolution when he was just a young student. He was very active in the military. He became a close confidant of George Washington. He was at the Constitutional Convention. He was instrumental in um, getting New York to ratify the Constitution. And then, of course, he became the first Secretary of the Treasury, putting the United States on really sound financial footing. He had a vision for America that was one of industrial power and military might that was a huge contrast to some of the other founding fathers, like Jefferson and Madison, who saw us as an agrarian society uh, with a, uh, a large middle class and just fringe elements on the upper and lower classes. Uh, and the fact that it was his vision that prevailed uh, is what people will look at today that points to what, might, what some might consider the greatness of America, whether it truly is or not. Uh, so I would suggest that's his significance, is the financial institutions and the economy that we have is all based on his principles and really his alone. Alexander Hamilton was a true capitalist, a true capitalist who believed that free trade was best for the country, was best for merchants in the end, and was best for customers in the end. It would lower prices, it would produce better products. Um, at the same time, he would not recognize the system we have today. He was certainly not a supporter of uh, government supporting ordinary people but no one in the 18th century was. Inspired by Ron Chernow's biography, Miranda started to write material around Hamilton's life that would eventually form the basis of a show. He called it the Hamilton Mixtape. He has the everything in his life that makes for a great story, that makes for a great musical, and in so many ways it's perhaps surprising that it took until the 21st century that we have a play based on the life of Alexander Hamilton. I think it's kind of surprising that Lin-Manuel decided to do an entire musical based on the life of Alexander Hamilton, especially having done uh, In the Heights previously. You know, I don't know if you read the biography of Alexander Hamilton and just think, wow, this would make a really good hip-hop musical. It's a curious choice of source material, but yet at the same time, it's clear that Lin-Manuel saw elements in the biography of Alexander Hamilton that he could use to craft a story about the nature of the American character and um, the American dream that he wanted to tell. Well, what Lin-Manuel seems to focus on uh, through hip hop, of course, is the story of a self-made man, somebody young and hungry, in fact, that's uh, one of the main lyrics, and comes over to the United States to start a new life and ends up rising to heights that he himself could never have guessed. And I think that that's the aspirational impact and drive of the entire play. Lin-Manuel's vision for Hamilton was to tell the story of a founding father through hip hop. It was a radical idea, matching historical narrative with an ethnically diverse cast and rap music. And it would be something completely new for Broadway, which in 2008 was ready for a shakeup. Broadway went through a very, very difficult period in the late 60s and into the 70s where New York City was going bankrupt, Times Square was dangerous. There was no such thing as a Lion King or a family show in 1975. But like many other businesses in New York City at that time, Broadway could not leave New York. Where's Broadway gonna go? What, New Jersey? No. Broadway had to survive. And it survived the only way it knew how to survive was it found young, creative people the Lin-Manuel Mirandas of their day to back, who created shows that suddenly became attractions that people wanted to see. So if you go back 40 years ago, the Lin-Manuel Miranda of the early 70s was a guy named Michael Bennett, who was a choreographer, who had this dream of a show 
about the dancers in the chorus of a Broadway show, the gypsies, we call them. And from that, he fashioned a show called A Chorus Line, which was the Hamilton of its day. And when that opened on Broadway, in Times Square at the Schubert Theater, suddenly this business that had been moribund had life in it again. And then in the 80s, and we have the British to thank for this, Cameron McIntosh and Andrew Lloyd Webber came along with this completely cockamamie idea for a musical about children's poems about cats that turned into the most successful show in the history of Broadway and made so much money for this industry and for New York City that it began to lift the fortunes of Broadway, Times Square, and New York City. And then when you start to have things like Les Miserables and The Phantom of the Opera and Miss Saigon, you have a Broadway that is no longer the backwater of the entertainment industry, but a business that is literally making billions of dollars on these shows that travel all over the world. By the time Hamilton was being developed, the American Musical Theater was kind of in an amorphous and you might say <laughs> almost morbid state of uncertainty about what it, what it could be. There were lots of attempts to kind of try to find new voices for, for the musical. You couldn't be too flat out serious, that was dreary. You certainly couldn't be too cheerful and old fashioned because people would snore. You, you couldn't have phantoms with masks singing at the top of their lungs. There were just a lot of things you couldn't do anymore and yet not a clear idea of what you could do. In 2008, when In the Heights appeared on Broadway, a lot of the other shows of the time tended to be jukebox musicals, and by that I mean musicals that uh, would take an existing song catalog by a pop artist or band and then create an original dramatic narrative around that song catalog. So I'm thinking of Jersey Boys, for instance, uh, which celebrated the music of Frankie Valli for seasons, Mamma Mia, which celebrated the music of ABBA. I think Broadway started to rely on jukebox musicals because they were a sure thing. So at a moment in which Broadway is not able to kind of take the artistic risks that it might have in the past, in the heyday of work by people like Michael Bennett and so on, um, I, think, I think jukebox musicals provided a safe alternative uh, for the Broadway community because people were definitely going to come to these musicals because they already knew the music, um, so there's an immediate buy-in and then you would just sort of wrap a story around the music. So this is the moment in which Lin-Manuel Miranda is developing Hamilton, a moment in which there's no sort of consensus about what musicals can be now, but a lot of consensus about what they can't be, and with certainly an understanding that new voices, new characters who have not been seen on stage, treated seriously, need to be part of the story. As the show developed, industry insiders started to circulate rumors about an exciting new musical based on the life of Alexander Hamilton. And in May 2009, the public got their first look. Lin-Manuel appeared in an evening of poetry, music, and the spoken word at the White House and performed some of the material from the Hamilton mixtape in front of the president and the first lady. It's a concept album about the life of someone I think embodies hip hop, Treasury Secretary Alexander Hamilton. How does a bastard orphan son of a whore and a Scotsman dropped in the middle of a forgotten spot in the Caribbean by providence impoverished and squalor grow up to be a hero and a scholar the ten dollar founding father without a father got a lot farther by working a lot harder by being a lot smarter by being a self-starter by 14 they you placed him in charge of the trade and charter the initial reaction to the idea was skeptical I mean, a hip-hop musical about the Founding Fathers, and oh, by the way, they're all gonna be played by black people and Hispanic people and no white people. You know, a little strange. Uh, but there was a, what we call a workshop, very private for Friends of Lynn's, the backers of the show, and I happen to have a few spies there. I heard that people were really impressed. They thought, you know, the songs are terrific, He's created these compelling characters in the Founding Fathers. It doesn't feel starchy, it doesn't feel historical, it feels contemporary, it feels vital. It has tremendous theatricality and energy. And that's when I began hearing, you know, you should keep your eye on this show. We have to remember, Lin-Manuel Miranda was known to those of us in the theater back then, but not to the 
world at large. It was probably the Obama's endorsement of Hamilton has made it into the phenomenon that it is today. But the real standout from the White House show was that the Hamilton mixtape was, as its name suggested, all about hip hop. When Lin-Manuel stood rapping in front of the president, it was clear to observers that he was planning to try and succeed where others had failed and make hip hop a hit on Broadway. All right, drop the beat. He's throwing up some words. I'm gonna say some freestyling that you never heard. Constitution, the POTUS. I'm freestyling, you know this. Obamacare, okay, I'm looking up because it was ruthless before. You enacted that system. The Federalist Papers, Hamilton wrote the other 51 and greater. And Sonny and Bo is canine. It's insane. That's a nine. Oh my God. We're telling a story of music on stage, so it's a musical. That's really the only definition of musical theater music. We're telling a story on stage through music. Both of them. Everything else, it's up to you to write the rules. And for me, the fun was, you know, if that initial inspiration was Hamilton is a singularly hip hop character. Um, you can't tell his story in any other musical genre. Porque usa más palabra. Uh, he uses more words than any of the other founders. He leaves behind more writing than any of the other founders. If you did an opera, it would be a day long. Um, you need hip hop because hip hop has more words per measure than any other genre of music. Um, and also it has that energy, that energy of um, making something out of nothing, of writing so well about your circumstances that you transcend them. There have been many attempts historically to try to incorporate hip hop into uh, musical theater in particular. Um, I'm thinking in the 1990s of Bringing the Noise, Bringing the Funk, the George C. Wolfe directed show that starred Savion Glover that was a mix of tap and funk and hip hop. And that was um, quite successful in its time. But I think generally speaking, hip hop as a form um, that pursues a certain kind of authenticity that is very much related to street credibility, um, that is very much rooted in the blues where you know, you live the life that you sing about in your song or that you rap about in your song. There's a way in which that rubs up against the kind of expressive inauthenticity of musical theater. You know, there's been attempts at blending hip hop and theater in the past, whether it was most deaf being in Top Dog Underdog, you know, Puff Daddy, he had a major role in uh, Raising the Sun, even like a, the Tupac play that they tried to bring. So then here comes Hamilton, and I think it's something where it's like all overnight success or all sort of like this big tower and success comes from a road that was paved by other people. To take some of the dominant themes in the mythology of hip hop, having to do with underdogs rising to the mainstream of culture, you know, to take some of those themes and to apply them to the retelling of history. I think that's really powerful as a gesture. And then, of course, all of the beefs and fights that Alexander Hamilton got into over the course of his long career run parallel to beefs and fights in hip hop, which are part of the nature of the form itself. What I do think is the core of the success of the use of hip hop in Hamilton is the fact that in any one minute passage of a song, in hip hop, you will have, oh, say, four to 10 times more words than you would in a traditional song. So he has the ability to, to provide four to 10 times more information in any moment of the show. Part of the, why the show is so overwhelming, you really are being given a ton of information at all times, and it doesn't ever let up. Once I decided Hamilton is a singularly hip hop figure, and this is all my first time reading the book, mind you. I go, okay, so who, what does he sound like? And that's how you start to build a score. All right, so he's not gonna be, he's gonna be like my heroes. He's gonna rhyme six syllables on a line if he needs to. He's gonna be the son of Rakim, the son of Eminem, the son of Big Pun. Yeah. Uh, Big Pun, who has one of my favorite hip hop lyrics of all time. Dead in the middle of little, 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 did we know that we riddled you middle men who didn't do diddly. Yeah. Yeah. Lyricists that make you rewind them instantly because you can't believe how many rhymes have happened on a line. Um, those are the ones I love and the ones I keep coming back to and Big Pun was a big one of those for me. And so it took me a year to write my shot because my shot is mostly 
in Hamilton's voice. And I wanted it to have those, those big punish lines where every syllable is filled and making a, at least a four syllable rhyme every time, right? So it's, uh, I'm a diamond in the rough, which is a big pun lyric. A shiny piece of coal trying to reach my goal. My power of speech is unimpeachable. Only 19, but my mind is older, which is a mob deep lyric. These New York City streets get cold. I shoulder every burden, every disadvantage. I've learned to manage. I don't have a gun to brandish. I walk these streets famished. The plan is to fan this spark into a flame. But damn, it's getting dark, so let me spell out the name. So even the end of line agrees with the beginning of the next line. So they have to follow each other. And it's as strung together as like the best thick rope. So now, what does everyone else sound like? Okay, so I'm reading through, I'm reading about George Washington, and I'm reading about him fleeing New York, and it's this moral authority. He's the only veteran we have. So it's this very regimented, it's as regimented as military thinking is. Uh, it's, can I be real a second? For just a millisecond, boom, let down my guard and tell these people how I feel. There's no syncopation in it at all. It's super da kan 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 because he's a military man. He likes a military rhyme. Um, Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson misses most of the war, but he writes our founding documents. He writes that Declaration of Independence, but he's just been chilling in France. He's been an ambassador to France. So I sort of cast him as the jazz that leads to hip hop. So I listen to a lot of Lambert Hendricks and Ross. I listen to a lot of Gil Scott Heron. I listen to sort of the jazz that if you put a beat under it, it would be hip hop, but it's jazz. It was, it was cool. Like he, it, it, it was from the flow and to the cadence and to the way they were dropping on the beat. I mean, so much so that the soundtrack uh, to Hamilton like charted. Like people that went into, like people can say like, oh, I was into Hamilton, did you go to the show? Nah, but I listened to that soundtrack. And especially you think about all these people who weren't able to get tickets to the show. And it's like, instead they have this like soundtrack that they can go to and you, could, you can bear witness to the talent on an audio level. Lin-Manuel eventually sent a copy of the Hamilton mixtape to Oscar Eustace, artistic director of New York's Public Theater. Originally founded by the left-wing producer and director Joe Papp, over the years the public had built a reputation for original, challenging, and radical theater. When Oscar Eustace heard Lin-Manuel's tape, he immediately offered to develop the show at the public, and Hamilton had its first home. Public theater was founded by uh, Joe Papp in the 1950s, and he believed that Shakespeare and theater should not just be for the rich. They should be available to the poor and the working classes of America. And that's why he called his theater the public theater, because it's for the public. Some of the musicals that the public has produced have represented real change points in the development of musical theater, starting with one of its earliest, Hair, in 1968, which began downtown off-Broadway and they moved it to Broadway. Uh, a chorus line is the most famous one and has helped them produce serious non-musical plays for decades ever since. And more recently, a show like Fun Home and Hamilton have also been produced there. Lynn sent the tape to Oscar. I'm sure Oscar liked some of the tunes, but Oscar hadn't seen the script yet. He didn't know what the show was gonna look like. But he liked what he heard, and he, more importantly, he liked Lin-Manuel Miranda. He believed that Lin-Manuel Miranda was a genuine artist who was going to create something that he wanted to be a part of. And that is fundamentally the job of the artistic director. It's what Joe Papp did brilliantly, and it's what Oscar does. They back the people who are going to create the shows that we're one day going to be talking about. To the extent that a show needs to build from a core audience toward a larger audience, it's often useful that a show be able to be branded that way and, and people know, oh, that's likely the kind of thing I'm going to enjoy. What happens, though, is you open up the public theater, you already have this buzz building about the show. You have the critics coming in. They rave about it. You only have 250 seats to sell a night. Every VIP in this country, believe me, was trying to get into that show, which just amped the buzz even further. So you have this phenomenon created in this tiny little theater that's gonna to have to explode eventually, and the only way it can explode is to go to Broadway and explode there. Hamilton opened at the public in February 2015 to huge acclaim. 
critics raved about Lin-Manuel Miranda's vision, and a seat in the small, intimate auditorium soon became the most sought-after ticket in town. You know, a publicist in New York was like begging me to go see it. And he was saying, oh, you know, it's, it's really good, you know, it's, it's like hip-hop and, you know, American history. And I'm like, oh, man, like, Broadway does hip-hop. No, thank you. You know, and I, I finally just, you know, kind of to humor this guy, you know, said, okay, you know, I'd like tickets for tomorrow. And I was just knocked out. It was just, it was like the last thing I expected. The reviews for Hamilton were off the hook. I mean, it was really one of the best review shows I can imagine. There's been a few moments in my lifetime in American theater where there's just been shows that are not really just shows, but they are cultural movements in a particular direction. And I think Hamilton is also one of those incredibly galvanizing moments in American theater um, where it's critically acclaimed and it's also commercially successful. Beginning with an opening song that summarizes his childhood, Hamilton traces the story of Alexander Hamilton's life, from being raised as an orphan in the Caribbean through to his death in 1804 at the hands of arch-rival Aaron Burr. Over its two acts, the play touches on Hamilton's personal life, professional achievements, political ideas, and his relationship to other renowned historical figures, with many critics commenting on its mature and nuanced depiction of America's founding fathers. The examination of Hamilton's life in the show concentrates on his immigrant and outsider status. He could never be elected president because he wasn't born here in America. He came from the West Indies. And he was an outsider who could make it because he was creating the establishment that he was going to make it in. He was inventing himself and the country at the same time. You know, often when we are presented with the Founding Fathers, you know, it, it's either in a very almost religious way, you know, in which they're the kind of pantheon of saints, you know, or it's the opposite. You tear this one down, that one owns slaves, this one, you know, it was problematic for this reason or that reason. And I think Hamilton really presented these characters in three-dimensional terms and in recognizably contemporary terms, which is why I think a lot of like young people like it. It reminds us that this country almost didn't come together, that there were 13 independent colonies that had different economies, different worldviews and that the men from those colonies that came to put this country together represented those views that were often in conflict with each other. And there were no guarantees that they were gonna succeed in creating the United States, the United States of America. But Hamilton shows that in the end, they rose above intractable disagreements, hatred for each other to create a country. Among the historical figures that appear in Hamilton are George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, King George III, and the Marquis de Lafayette. It is the lesser known Aaron Burr, however, that takes center stage as the former Vice President of the United States and key character in the Hamilton narrative. I think the dramatic core of Hamilton is the relationship of Hamilton to Aaron Burr. And um, there was a contentious relationship um, where Aaron Burr, he went to Aaron Burr initially for mentorship. They had a lifelong relationship and then Aaron Burr ended up killing him at the end. So I think that's really the centerpiece of the entire show. I think it's all about Aaron Burr's childhood. He lost his mother very early on and um, I think that made Aaron Burr into an arrogant man, uh, an insecure man, and also one who was looking for his parental figures all his life and did not find them. He was also not as happily married as Alexander Hamilton was. Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton met while they were both aides to George Washington. Both men were in their early 20s. And politically, they actually had similar views. Both of them were Federalists. But nevertheless, 
they did not like each other personally because I think in some ways they were too similar. Burr was also someone who was even more arrogant than Hamilton and somehow they just did not get along. Uh, the bitterness between Aaron Burr and um, Alexander Hamilton goes back to 1791 when Hamilton's father-in-law, Philip Schuyler, was uh, unseated uh, in the Senate by Aaron Burr. And so he didn't really care for Aaron Burr for quite a long time. And then in 1800, when there was an electoral college tie, um, Hamilton worked behind the scenes to see that uh, the tie between Burr and Jefferson was broken with Jefferson becoming president. Even though he didn't stomach Jefferson, he liked him better than Burr. He, he literally called him a dangerous man uh, who the reins of government should not be entrusted to. Burr and Hamilton engaged in the, I would argue, late 18th century version of hip hop, which is writing essays. That was their duel of words. And it had been going on for a long time. That was the weapon of the day. They were smart about it. They used pseudonyms. They didn't use their real names. They had other newspapers on their side. And it was very much a, a war of words, a game of words. The bad blood between the pair eventually reached its deadly conclusion in the summer of 1804, when Burr challenged Hamilton to a duel. Lin-Manuel's play culminates in the dramatic restaging of Pistols at Dawn on the west bank of the Hudson River in New Jersey, where Alexander Hamilton was fatally shot at the age of 47. The duel between Burr and Hamilton um, uh, was a culmination of uh, a correspondence where neither would back down. Burr wanted uh, an acknowledgement or denial that he had said despicable things about him. Hamilton refused to acknowledge uh, anything unless he was more specific. And it became a stalemate and to where it became a battle of pride. And when he said, I challenge you to a duel, uh, Hamilton agreed. Hamilton could have ended it by simply saying, um, if I've said anything to offend you, uh, it was unintentional. That would have done it. Hamilton did have an abhorrence for dueling. He suggested that uh, it was completely uncivilized, he was against it, yet his pride was on the line. Hamilton writes a long list of the pros and cons, and then he proceeds. I think he knew he was going to die. I don't think Burr gave it as much thought as Hamilton did. I also think that Hamilton wanted to miss the shot. Burr did not. The tradition at the time was when you fire your first shot, if your message is, I don't intend to fire at you, you shoot directly into the ground. Hamilton, by all accounts, may have fired accidentally. He shot into the air and it went into a tree behind Burr and he turned around and shot Hamilton. It's also possible he wasn't trying to hit Hamilton. It's possible he likewise was intending to miss, uh, but uh, pistols back then oftentimes went far off from other targets. As well as their deadly encounter on the banks of the Hudson, the play depicts Burr's refusal to assist Hamilton in the drafting of the Federalist Papers and introduces the audience to some of the central ideas in Hamilton's political philosophy. The Federalist Papers are a series of essays that Alexander Hamilton and James Madison wrote together to persuade Americans to ratify the Constitution, to understand the Constitution, to understand why there needed to be a separation of powers, why a republic was the only way a country could survive that would not be a monarchy, why we needed to have a House of Representatives that was popularly elected, but why we also needed senators who would, at that point at least, not be popularly elected, why we needed to have an independent judiciary, why we needed to have a limited executive, um, why we needed to have a treasury, why we needed to have a Bill of Rights eventually. When you really think about that era and consider that some of the greatest minds of our time happen to be alive and in the same room to make these things happen is uh, a compelling story. And Hamilton himself was the visionary whose uh, idea of an industrial culture and a turning a country into a superpower was the vision that prevailed. Uh, it makes him all the more fascinating and, uh, and it's, it's a format that enables us to really see the other people around him and how this was possible.
This theme is further illustrated in the show by Hamilton's relationship with both Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, played by David Diggs and Okiereri Onadawan, which sets out the competing visions that the trio had for the future of the USA. Hamilton's relationship to Jefferson and Madison was uh, one of contemporaries. They both, they all started out as Federalists, believed in a uh, central government, but diverged in terms of how strong that central government should be. And so if there was personal animosity, it was grounded in their political ideologies. Where they drifted apart the most, I think, was in Hamilton's insistence on a national bank and tying ourselves to big money interests where Madison and Jefferson both sincerely believed that we should be an agrarian society and not be tied to European banks. Madison and Jefferson both believed that it would take a thousand years to settle this country east to west. And I think Hamilton understood somewhere, somehow, that it was going to be much faster than this and that the country needed to make preparations for growing, for increased commerce, for increased competition with other countries and for treaties with other countries. Finally, the musical explores Hamilton's personal life, his marriage to the wealthy Elizabeth Schuyler in 1780, his extramarital affair with Maria Reynolds, and the tragic death of his eldest son, Philip, who is fatally wounded in a duel in a grim foretelling of the fate that would later befall Alexander. It is Elizabeth Schuyler, however, who takes center stage in the Hamilton narrative, and she's introduced early on in the show with the upbeat celebratory number, The Schuyler Sisters. Angelica, Eliza, and Peggy. Angelica, Peggy, Eliza, what? Daddy said to be home by sundown. Daddy doesn't need to know. Daddy said not to go downtown. Like I said, you're free to go. But look around, look around. The revolution's happening in New York. New York. He was really good looking. He was a great writer, a good talker, and very charming, apparently, um, who um, met in the woman that he ended up marrying, Eliza, the exact woman that he had described just about a year, year and a half earlier. And she was this, this amazing woman who couldn't have loved him anymore. And I think it's very appropriate that the musical begins with her and it ends with her. In its warts and all depiction of Alexander Hamilton's life, the play presents a three-dimensional view of the Founding Fathers, one which isn't afraid to show them as flawed human beings. Hamilton biographer Ron Chernow described it as history for grown-ups. We tend to think of our founding fathers as these figures on Mount Rushmore. They're made of granite. Lynn made them flesh and blood. He made them human. You saw the bickering. You saw the squabbling. You saw the dirty political compromises they had to make. You saw the burning ambition, the hatred between Burr and Hamilton. You saw the jealousy that Burr had for the, Hamilton's success, that Hamilton outfoxed him at every turn. I think approaching history in a way that doesn't deify the uh, Founding Fathers makes those characters all the more compelling. Historians don't always do that. They tend to mythologize Thomas Jefferson and suggest, for instance, that it was never in his character to have fathered children with a slave. And when you look at the evidence, it's overwhelmingly uh, supports the contrary. And I think those are the things that actually make those characters um, real. And I think those are things that we identify. When you deify somebody, they become as interesting as the statues that we erect to them, as opposed to the flaws that truly make someone human. I think that's what's connecting people, just the humanity of it. Um, people are, I think people are seeing themselves in, in how flawed these people are, and it's giving them hope because of the wonderful things these people were still able to achieve, even with their flaws. It's a show about a politician that is also about policy. There is a tremendous amount of material about banking policy, about dealing with the French Revolution, about slave owning. It is unique in musical theater, as far as I know, with, with one exception, in dealing with the policy questions that animated the politicians we take an interest in. But in taking such an approach to its subject, Hamilton inevitably opened a debate about historical accuracy, 
with some critics noting that the show sidesteps some of the more uncomfortable questions of the time, in particular, the attitude of the main protagonists towards slavery. I think one of the most exciting things about Hamilton is the level of um, conversation about American history that it's provoked. You know, there's a sense in which, you know, people argue, you know, was Hamilton as against slavery as, you know, as the play depicts? The Schuyler family that he married into, they were slaveholders. What was Hamilton's attitude about immigrants, for example? You know, people have contested that. You know, there are all of these questions that have come up I think most of the criticism of the play has been those kinds of debates. Is this an accurate portrayal? Is it a fair portrayal? You know, what corners is it cutting? And, and you can say that of anything that's based on a historical event, that, oh, there should be a more balanced approach. But I don't think it's balanced so much as telling the, uh, it's a story that has two sides to the same coin. And in his instance, it's the contradiction of being a self-made man coming from nothing and yet his vision for America's greatness lied in uh, elitist ruling. And I think they go hand in hand and to not examine one um, is to leave something out that I think is integral to his character and to his story. Nonetheless, what is there is accurate. Hamilton's most obvious break with historical accuracy is in the makeup of its multi-ethnic cast. With almost all of its parts played by actors of color, Hamilton presented a bold statement about diversity and the nature of contemporary America. I think the statement is, you know, this is our history too. You know, we are here, you know, and we can play these roles and we can make it our story. You know, it's the way it kind of flips this like convention of what America is. And so like, some, you know, some of my like favorite images that are kind of seared into my brain is like, when you see, uh, to take it to like music, when you see like Frank Ocean, who is a singer and he wears like an American flag as a bandana or like Outkast and, and you know, they'll have like a flag behind them. It's so incredibly powerful where it's like, you take in like the foundation of this country with the actual idea of what this country is and now people are seeing that and it's just this uh, imprint that's just gonna be uh, uh, kind of like a permanent record to a lot of like young people. When you're watching it on stage after about a minute, it makes no difference. This is the man who is James Madison. This is the man who is Thomas Jefferson. You're not thinking, why is Thomas Jefferson black? He, the theater is amazing that way. Broadway for a long time was called the Great White Way, and then that became kind of a disparaging comment because the shows were by and large white, and the audiences certainly were were white. But as young people become more interested in Broadway since the success of Rent, they're not all white kids. And they're bringing new voices and new music to the form of the musical theater, which I think is good and healthy in the long run. And I think Hamilton is a show that says, doesn't matter what color you are or what your background is or what your ethnicity is, the musical theater is an art form that you can thrive in, that you should be attracted to. There has been so much exclusion in the theater in which um, people of color have generally only been able to tell certain kinds of stories and to say certain things on Broadway and their, their involvement in Broadway has been very, very circumscribed and very um, limited. And so to tell not just any story, but a founding story of the narrative of American life has a kind of meta relevance, right? It's a, it's a commentary itself on the role of people of color in this country. I've gotten emails from movie executives who say, you totally made me rethink the casting of this project or that project, um, because I saw what an incredibly talented, diverse group of faces can do to an audience. Um, It's a wonderful feeling to, to have that kind of impact and when, when something has that kind of success, it reverberates. That's part of the excitement that I think people felt. Who are these amazing performers? Why haven't we seen them before? Oh, because there was nothing to see them in. And Hamilton proved to be the perfect platform for a new generation of actors to show their talent. 
a host of standout performances earned the play's cast a total of seven Tony nominations, with Lin-Manuel Miranda, Leslie Odom Jr., Philippa Sue, David Diggs, Jonathan Groff, Christopher Jackson, and Renee Elise Goldsberry all recognized for their work. Well, I thought Lin-Manuel Miranda was great in his role, obviously, as Hamilton. I mean, I, you know, in a sense, he was telling his own story. I feel like he very much identified with the character that he created. And David Diggs, who played Lafayette and Jefferson, you know, just moving between those two roles was really fun and exciting and intriguing to watch. Getting to play a role where, where I get to take these things that I learned from just trying to walk around like my dad walks around, you know, has been so great. How, I don't know, and Thomas Jefferson, like, come on, there's no way that that should be real, that I should, uh, that I should get to read lines written for Thomas Jefferson and be like, yeah, that's my father. <laughs> Except maybe that's way too real. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I think um, it's, been, it's been so great and it's been so much fun. It's one of the things, one of the great things about this process is how much of ourselves we were asked to bring to it and how much sense it kept making to do that. Well, I think the real star of the show, um, in terms of the acting, was Leslie Odom Jr. And, you know, Lynn, uh, Lynn is certainly a talented guy. He created this show, but he was the weakest performer of them all because he's not a great actor. And Leslie Odom was so charismatic and so compelling as Aaron Burr. And also, it's always better, I think, to play the villain. You know, it's just a juicier part. And Leslie played it with a kind of ferocity and an intensity that was pretty thrilling when you saw it. And when he was, um, especially at the public theater, he was at this level, and Lynn was still, you know, wobbling around here trying to find the character. Now, I mean, listen, he also was writing the show and fixing the show, so he had a few distractions there. But Leslie, to me, was the real, the real star of that show. This show has, you know, um, sort of helped me find some direction, helped me find some purpose again. Uh, this is um, what I always felt like I was meant to be doing, but I was waiting for, I was waiting for Lynn to write it. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it was the combination of their exceptional qualities that was stunning that they were able to find so many people who could perform very difficult work so brilliantly. And now, with the second cast and with the touring casts, it's not like they're having a lot of trouble finding these people. They've been waiting for something to come along with which they could show who they are. So th that, to me, is the thing. Yes, I loved Renee Elise Goldsberry or David Diggs, or each day might be a different person depending on what I'm listening to, but it was more all of them together that did it for me. But as with any work of musical theater, the star of the show is the music itself. Although billed as a hip hop musical, the play's score moves beyond rap to take in a series of other styles, from beat music of the 1960s to traditional show tunes. On its release in September 2015, the original cast recording proved to be an enormous hit, reaching as high as number three on the Billboard chart and winning a Grammy Award for Best Musical Theatre Album. One thing that's beautiful about Lin-Manuel Miranda is that he really reflects the way we listen to music now. We listen to every kind of music, so every kind of music is, is um, useful um, when you're writing music theater now. And there isn't really a style of music in this the season alone. There's country music, there's hip-hop, there's classical. There's, it's, it's all really there, it's all relevant, it all matters. And the most important thing as a performer that you can do is really have the confidence to know that what you your voice is doing is right. How did we know that this plan would work? We had a spy on the inside, that's right. I believe I don't know. Tell a on the British government. I take the measurements of formation and then I smuggle it. To my brother's revolutionary covenant. I'm running with the sons of liberty and I am loving it. See, that's what happens when you up against the ruffians. We in the sh somebody's got to shovel it. Hercules Mulligan, I need no introduction. When you knock me down, I get the back up again. I think the music of Hamilton is really interesting because although it is clearly rooted in hip hop and some of the standout numbers in the show are 
are, are the, the rap numbers. There's also a lot of other types of music in the show. There's kind of British pop music of the 60s. There is R&B. There is more traditional kind of Andrew Lloyd Webber style music in it. So it's very, very diverse, much more than I think it's been given credit for. I actually think the introductory number, Alexander Hamilton, is probably the most one of the most striking numbers in the show because it introduces you to the larger themes, the major characters, um, and um, you know, Lin Manuel has this thing where his his opening numbers for his shows, like in In the Heights, his first show in two thousand eight. You know, they they provide the kind of narrative impetus for the entire show. They introduce us to all the themes, but they do it with this incredible wordplay. Um, and so I remember seeing it on Broadway and just thinking, wow, like opening number. I mean, people, the standing ovation almost at the at the uh, the end of the opening number. It was it was that galvanizing and that powerful. We fought with him. Me, I died for him. Me, I trusted him. Me, I loved him. And me, I'm the damn fool that shot him. There's a million things I haven't done, but just you wait. The depiction of King George III in the play is just hilarious because it works on so many levels. The music is very Beatlesque, you know, which is a kind of pun on the English and American thing also. And it's also a kind of pun on like boomer culture and like this young insurgent culture because there's a very passive aggressive quality to Jonathan Groff in the original production and his performance as King George III. You know, he's dressed up like Elton John. Beautiful, more traditional kind of musical theater numbers, very melodic. Lynn has a gift for melody, which I didn't appreciate the first time around. Very important, you can't have musical theater songs without a melodic line. And sometimes hip hop and rap, the melodic line is not that strong. So if you had a score that was just one hip hop rap number at the, after the other, I don't think it would be as successful as it is. He's found a way to vary it up. So uh, I think a song like The Room Where It Happens is very, very powerful. It's a slowly emerging song of ambition and jealousy of Aaron Burr saying, why am I left out? Why am I not the one making the decisions? Why am I not there when this big stuff is going down? So it's a very good character number because it really shows you why Aaron Burr comes to hate Alexander Hamilton because Hamilton's knocked him by and he's got to get back in the room. And the only way he can get in the room is to kill Alexander Hamilton. You know, one of the really compelling songs you know, in the musical is My Shot. You know, where you really feel that energy of Alexander Hamilton to make it. And it's, you know, it's, that's such an American theme. And I am not throwing away my shot, shot. I am not throwing away my shot, shot. I'm just like my country, I'm young, scrappy, and hungry. And I'm not throwing away my shot. I am not throwing away my shot. I am not throwing away my shot. I'm not going to give up my shot. You know, this is it. Like, we're going for it. You know, in that sense, uh, that level of conviction is something that, you know, really comes through, you know, in the play. And it links this kind of revolutionary musical, you know, to very traditional themes in American history. So even as it's breaking certain molds, it's adhering to certain others. In bringing Hamilton to life on stage, Lin-Manuel Miranda turned to his firm friend and frequent collaborator, Thomas Kale. Kale first met Miranda while both were students at Wesleyan in the late 90s. He co-founded the hip-hop troupe Freestyle Love Supreme and was instrumental in the development of In the Heights, which he directed. 
When Lin-Manuel had his original idea for Hamilton, Cale was quick to come on board as the show's director. You know, Lin wrote the first song in 2009, and it's June of 2016. So that's seven years. That's seven years of your life that you spend trying to take this little seed and grow it into not just a tree, but a forest. That's really what my job is, to try to create an environment where the writer can feel nurtured and supported and alive. And then I try to add other seeds around him and find other people to make me better and to try to realize the show. His direction never got in the way of Lynn's score and Lynn's script. He's not a director who puts his thumbprints over everything. He understood that the power of the show was in the music, the lyrics, and the storytelling. And his direction is very skillful, but you don't walk away from that show thinking, wow, who is that director? What an amazing production. You walk away from that show thinking, my God, Lin-Manuel Miranda is a genius. And Tom understood that, that his job was to serve Lin's show. The reality is, obviously, everybody on stage and off stage in this company is working at the absolute top of their game. And I think that the, the baseline of everything is trust and faith. So that's why saying no isn't that hard. That's why saying maybe is also not that hard. And saying yes isn't that hard. The reality is sometimes the best answer you can give is keep going. Uh, it is very rare that I would ever do anything that would, that would stunt or, or prevent anyone from taking an idea and fully expanding it. So my job is to create a, a room where everybody knows what they're being asked to do, that everybody knows what story we're telling and how we want to tell it. So the reality is, you know, Lynn and I got to a place, and, and Alex and Andy share this, where it was almost subliminal. There were times when he would just cock his head and I'd be like, I know, I know, just let me go through the thing. Um, <laughs> but the reality is, it was, it was such a safe room for all of us that these actors also knew that they were allowed to live in a place where they could explore, and, and we tried to create that for each other. He didn't overdo it. He didn't like say, okay, this is my shot and then overshoot it. The, the staging is very stepped back when it needs to be. Again, understanding that the verbal information is tricky and needs to be forefronted most of the time. So he, he gives space to the verbal component, which is a joy for theater goers who remember when plays still were about words. Both Kale and Miranda are steeped in the history of musical theater, and although Hamilton has been repeatedly praised for its originality, its creator and director have acknowledged that a number of other shows had an important influence on their own production. Lin-Manuel's expertise in, in the genre is just genius. I, I would suggest he could very well be the future of uh, American musical theater, and at the same time, he, throughout his work, even though it's enveloped in hip hop, you see a nod to Sondheim in the density of his lyrics. You see uh, Hart and Hammerstein and the great composers that he was obviously influenced by. There are several influences on Hamilton. I think uh, Stephen Sondheim, as Lynn acknowledges, because Steve uh, wrote, of course, music and lyrics, but also he, he did adult shows. He didn't do musical fables. He didn't do shows for the tired businessman. He did, with Hal Prince, challenging shows. Company, which is about marital strife. Follies, which is about aging. And Sweeney Todd, which is about murder and cannibalism. Certainly Sweeney Todd, in the hugeness of the central character and the ambition of the work. The works of Candor and Ebb, Chicago, Cabaret, are certainly evident uh, as uh, an inspiration for the emphasis on thematic development. 1776 is a very important show that should not be overlooked. That show written by Peter Stone was a show that said the Founding Fathers are not in the textbook. They're not on Mount Rushmore. They're flesh and blood, vital human beings. And I think without, without 1776, I don't think Lynn could have pulled off Hamilton. I would also say, aside from the usual names you hear, I mean, Rodgers and Hammerstein are of, are of course there. He quotes them subtly and humorously a lot, Jesus Christ Superstar. But I think you can't forget Gilbert and Sullivan also, uh, the last real exemplars of that level of verbal wit in musical theater. I think Lynn would say that the most profound influence on him was Rent. 
you had no musicals that spoke to young people going through their struggles in the 90s. And that was what Rent was. It was poor, struggling artists living in New York City at a time when many of them were being killed by AIDS. And it had a rock and roll score. So it suddenly felt contemporary and it brought young people to the theater. And it brought the generation that would become the Lin-Manuel Mirandas who fell in love with musicals because of Rent. Among what he called the grandparents of Hamilton, Thomas Kale listed both Sweeney Todd and Evita as two productions that have had a clear impact on the staging of the show. I think the staging, Hal Prince's staging of Sweeney Todd, is very important to the staging of Hamilton because it was on a grand scale with a lot of people that Hal was moving around. And you can see in Tom's staging of Hamilton, you can see echoes of Hal's original staging of Sweeney Todd because Sweeney Todd really evoked 18th century London, you know, right down to the the fog coming off the Thames, much as the staging and the set design of Hamilton evokes those taverns lit by candlelight where the Founding Fathers hashed out the country. You know, it was a very simple staging, but it was animated. And the thing that was just incredible was the choreography. Man, it was alive. I mean, everybody was moving. The design suggests a ship with uh, wooden planks and some ropes and things like that, possibly the ship of state. But other than that, withdraws itself to forefront the performances. When Hamilton hit Broadway in the summer of 2015, it blew up, becoming nothing short of a phenomenon all over America. The show was showered with awards, collecting a Grammy and the Pulitzer Prize alongside the avalanche of Tonys. In July 2016, Lin-Manuel gave a final farewell performance as Alexander Hamilton, before his understudy, Javier Munoz, stepped into the role. That fall, Hamilton began its journey towards becoming a global sensation. The play began a residence in Chicago. A touring cast was assembled to travel America in 2017, and it was announced that Les Miserables producer Cameron McIntosh would be overseeing an opening in London's West End. I started writing this in 2008, so this is a culmination of it's a celebration of a lot of people putting a lot of hard work, and particularly Tommy Kale, who got all the art forms involved in making a musical and made them into one cohesive thing called Hamilton. And the fact that we have so many nominations is a celebration of how many art forms it takes to make a musical, and that makes me really happy. Hamilton's success as a musical lies in the fact that certainly it's a great story. It's aspirational, it's American, and it's also a contemporary look at such material through the diversity of the cast, but I think its true genius lies in the uh, genius playwright himself in terms of Lin-Manuel's mastery of language and just the brilliance with which he is able to put a contemporary musical together that appeals. He could write about nothing and it would be brilliant. To take something of such substance uh, can't help but be a, an amazing success, which uh, of course it is and his intervention is to really include people of color on the American stage in a way that um, is transformative and that is sustainable and that changes the, the notion and nature of the Great White Way as an exclusionary space into something that's much more inclusionary. I think you have to go back to the medium, the use of hip hop, which for the first time in musical theater since possibly the 50s is a living form in popular music. Uh, for the last 40, 50 years, the way people sing in musicals, beautiful as it is, is not the same as what people are listening to on the radio or on their iPods. What often gets lost is the quality, and it's really good. You know, that's one reason. It's just really good the socio-political aspects of it, the casting of it, you know, all of that stuff, uh, its connection to larger social issues now, 
that are very much in the air concerning immigration and concerning race. That's obviously important. But if a play wasn't any good, none of that stuff would have mattered. I, I spent seven years writing this, um, so I want to hammer that home a lot. Um, Kicking beats from the cells <laughs> fuels my writing, um, and um, but 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 honestly, um, it's it's it takes a long time to get it uh, into this kind of shape, uh, and and that's an enormous act of faith, isn't it? Having stepped off the Hamilton stage, Lin Manuel Miranda quickly became a hugely sought-after artist and personality. He was invited to contribute music to Star Wars: The Force Awakens asked to write songs for the animated Disney film Moana, and handed a starring role in the Mary Poppins sequel, Mary Poppins Returns. Over the course of two short years, Lin-Manuel had become one of the most famous names in America, celebrated by legions of fans, all of whom wait with bated breath to see what comes next from the man who reawakened Broadway. Broadway's just not used to having like a, like a rock star, right? I'm sure everybody's just like, like what are you gonna do like next, man? Like the world is your oyster and he has like all the rope in the world to do anything that he wants and that's exciting, right? He's carried his audience along with him. He has all these new fans and all these expectations. I wanna see if he can now, with the platform he has built for himself and with the skills that he has honed, if he can now use his abilities to tell a musical story without hip hop. I enjoyed the hip hop in this show and I feel like it was necessary to this show in order to convey so much material so memorably. But I wonder what he can do without that. Now you might say, well that's the language that he's developed for himself, why ask him to do something else? And I agree with that too. But if he's writing a show for me right now, I'd like to see one where he really pushes his melodic abilities to the forefront rather than just his lyrical abilities. I, I think with a theater person and an artist like Lin-Manuel Miranda, you should expect the unexpected. His mind works in ways that mere mortals <laughs> don't. He sees things that we don't. You know, he read a 900-page biography of Alexander Hamilton, he saw a musical. He is like Andrew Lloyd Webber in that sense, you know? I mean, Andrew read some nonsense poems for kids about cats and saw a musical. He's like Cameron McIntosh, who picked up a thousand-page novel in French about a guy who steals bread and saw a Les Miserables. He's like Michael Bennett, who thought, you know, the stories of the anonymous people who dance in the chorus can make their own show. I think theater people like that are gonna come across something that captures their imagination that only they can see unfold in their head as a show, and eventually they will create it on a stage for all of us to see and enjoy. So from Lin-Manuel Miranda, I expect something that I've never seen before. <laughs>